You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. Robert Lawrence Kuhn is the creator, writer, host, and executive producer of Closer to Truth, the PBS public television series on cosmos, consciousness, and meaning that presents leading scientists, philosophers, and creative thinkers discussing fundamental questions. Dr. Kuhn has published over 30 books, including The Mystery of Existence, Why Is There Anything at All?, with John Leslie, and Closer to Truth, Challenging Current Belief. He is a featured expert voice on Space.com. He is an international corporate strategist and investment banker with a BA in human biology from Johns Hopkins and a PhD in anatomy and brain research from UCLA. And we're back with Robert Lawrence Kuhn. Um, Robert, now, before we uh, started talking and officially recording, you said something interesting that piqued my interest as an interest of yours. Why is there something rather than nothing? <laughs> so I'll ask this in a very broad way. Why is all of this here? <laughs> well, let me start by telling you a story um, that uh, for decades, I had remembered that when I was 12 years old at summer camp, trying to go to sleep, I thought of something that so frightened me that I put it out of my mind because it, it was terrifying. And for decades, I couldn't remember what that was. I was so successful at putting it out of my mind. And then, whatever it was, uh, right before we started Closer to Truth, um, I remembered. And that is the question you asked. Uh, what if there were nothing instead of anything? And the question uh, was so uh, disturbing to think because as I began to think about it, it if I'm just starting uh, from scratch, ab initio, tabula rasa, having nothing seems a lot easier, a lot simpler than having anything. Because if you have anything, you have to explain how you got that or why is it that way. But if you have nothing, you have nothing to explain, and so that seemed to be simpler. So it seemed to be that it was more logical that there would be nothing but there is obviously something. Um, and so that, that became sort of a, after I realized what I had repressed when I was a child, it sort of became a, a life partner. It, it, it's something that, uh, that uh, I would think about, uh, you know, try on the subway in New York or flying someplace or at night, whatever. Uh, and closer to truth, as a show uh, is to to no small degree uh, built on that angst of why is there something rather than nothing and indeed it is a major theme of the program not the only one of course but uh, we deal with uh, consciousness and fine-tuning and um, uh, the nature of God if there is a God uh, contradictions in, in uh, the theology as such um, but that ultimate question, why is there something rather than nothing, or why is there anything at all, remains the the fundamental question of, of reality. Um, and so after Close to the Truth we began, I began to really explore this uh, in, in, in great depth, interviews with uh, several dozen of the leading scientists and philosophers who address this question in, in modern times. Um, and I should mention one in particular uh, whose uh, books and whose way of thinking uh, was one of my great influencers on Closer to Truth, and that's the uh, British-Canadian philosopher John Leslie, uh, whose uh, books on uh, universes and uh, end time uh, thinking uh, and value as a progenitor of reality had a great influence on, on me. And uh, John was, in fact, um, one of the very first persons we interviewed. I think he was the second or third after Steven Weinberg. 
uh, in 2006 for the new Closer to Truth, the new series that uh, we began. Uh, subsequently, I should I should say that uh, John and I edited a book based upon our friendship and on Closer to Truth shows and his lifelong research. Uh, it's called The Mystery of Existence. Why is there anything at all? And it's a compilation of the best thinking throughout history, uh, both uh, both philosoph philosophers in history and in, in modern times, philosophers and scientists on addressing this uh, this question, including uh, essays by John himself and by me on, on what our approaches are, which which do differ, but we are totally uh, uh, unified in, in taking this question uh, very seriously. So one of the ways that I've uh, approached it is not to give an answer right away, because that's impossible, but rather to see what what does the question really mean? What, what, what does the question mean? And, and how, do you, how do you discern? And, and to do that, you really have to understand what do you mean by nothing? What do you mean by nothing? Because there are people, physicists today, who explain how you get something from nothing. Um, and uh, they, you, know, you don't need any mystery. You don't need any magic or God or anything. You could explain how there is nothing, uh, and, and, the, and quantum physics demands that uh, that the uh, the nothingness of of the vacuums has a, a cauldron of, because of the uncertainty principle in, uh, in Heisenberg uncertainty principle that and that there is this cauldron of, of particles and antiparticles constantly materializing and uh, annihilating. Um, and so you have this uh, quantum foam, and then from that you could derive, given enough time, and obviously there's plenty of time to to have something emerge from that, and then and then you show how the uh, the total amount of energy density in the universe is, is is effectively zero because you have the energy density of everything you see. Dark energy, dark matter, real matter, all well, the barrier, every, all, everything all together, plus the negative effect of gravitation, and that is a net zero. So you sort of get, as Alan Guth said, the ultimate free lunch. Um, and so that seems to many people to be an answer to the question, but to me, it it was not an answer at all uh, because it didn't answer where the laws of quantum physics come from. And so what I try to do is to just say, okay, let's just start at the most simplistic understanding of nothing and then get to the most complex uh, the, or the deepest understanding of nothing. And uh, so, so we know what we're dealing with, at least, when we say, how do you get something from nothing? We know what the something is, but we don't really know what the nothing is. So let me go through what I came up with you know, very quickly. And you start with the most simplistic idea of nothing. It's just uh, you know, empty. You look out, you see time and space. And it just happens to have no no objects in it, so it looks like nothing. Well, that's uh, utterly simplistic. It's pre-scientific, so you have to go to level two. So let's go to level two, where uh, you have an empty space, but now there are no particles in them, uh, because before there were particles, you just couldn't see them. Now we say, okay, no particles, uh, but there's energy. Uh, of course, this energy matter is an equivalent, so that's kind of artificial. So let's get rid of all the energy. That's now at number. Three. And so now you have empty space. You have existing time and space totally empty of all energy and matter. Uh, but then that that is uh, maybe a contingent fact that it, you know, so, somehow was there now pulled out and, and somehow eliminated. So let's make level four where there's no energy and no matter forever. There was never any energy and matter. So that's the, the fourth level of nothing. We're digging deeper. Now the fifth layer um, is that because of the fourth layer, you have the laws of quantum physics, so you can have something coming from nothing based on quantum tunneling and the, and the basic principles that we, we talked about, the particle-antiparticle pairs coming into being and occasionally splitting off and, uh, and, 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 creating, um, and creating universes. Um, and so that's in level four. So now let's, let's eliminate that. So there's, in level five, there are no laws of physics. Uh, that, there, that, that you don't have any laws of quantum physics. Now, if we look at this, level four is the level of what many physicists say are the how you get something from nothing. So in level four, 
you don't have any energy or matter or anything like that, but you do have uh, the laws of physics. Um, and that's where they start. Now, in my, 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 uh, my little uh, typology here, I have nine levels of nothing. So only the level four is the level of nothing of the quantum physicists, in a sense, because that's, that, that exists, the laws of quantum physics or string theory or whatever is fundamental exists in four. So number five, you eliminate that. So now there's no laws of physics, no pre-existing laws, particularly quantum physics. Um, and uh, now let's, uh, well, how do you go beyond that? So level six is now there's no, not even any space-time, no space-time, no a energy, no laws of physics, nothing that could even generate space-time or laws of, or, or mass, a or the mass energy of, of universes. Um, uh, so, okay, so that's number six. So now that's, there's absolutely nothing. Uh, is that, but I still have three levels deeper than that. So what could that possibly be? Because remember, level six, there's no space-time, no mass energy, no pre-existing laws of physics that could generate space-time or mass energy. Now, that sounds like really nothing, but there's deeper, because number seven says not only is there no space-time, no mass energy, no pre-existing laws of physics, but now there is also no non-physical things or kinds that are concrete. So no concrete non-physical realities. That means no gods, no god, no gods, no consciousness, no uh, anything that would be a concrete physical thing. And then you can see where I'm going. Level eight says not only is there no all the other stuff, no, no concrete non-physical things. Number eight says there's no even abstract physical things. That means no numbers, no sets, no logic, no general propositions, no universals, no platonic forms, none of that. And then level nine, I push it one step further and, and say there's not even any possibility of any of the above. Now, most people would say with legitimacy that le my levels eight and nine are logically impossible. Uh, you cannot eliminate abstract objects. How can you say that there is no number to the concept of number two um, and certainly how can you say there's no possibilities but I wanted to put those uh, for, for completeness so levels eight and nine no abstract objects or no possibilities are a way of showing the extent of the possible question but a legitimate discussion at least for a human mind I think is what I call level seven which says that uh, nothing has no space, no time, no mass, no energy, no pre-existing laws of physics, and no concrete non-physical things or kinds like gods or consciousness. So that gives us a, uh, a spectrum of how to conceive the word nothing. Now, the next step is, okay, now we have an understanding of nothing. We want to try to get to at least that number seven, because we don't think eight or nine maybe is even logical, but, you know, who knows? Uh, how, how, do, how do we say we get from that to where we know there is, is something? And, you know, I, to jump to the bottom line, because you asked me the, the question, what do I think? And I, I think you, uh, at some point, have to get to, to you have to have something that is uh, whose essence is its existence, something that is necessarily existing. Now, um, necessarily, we have to deal with that term as well. So be simple at first. And so, you know, just to pick two examples, pick the laws of physics, uh, whatever, uh, the deep law of physics, the, you know, the, the equation ultimately that can be written on a T-shirt, uh, which is not where we are today, but the ultimate laws of physics, which some believe are, uh, would be uh, inviolate in the sense that that's the only way reality could be. That's very controversial now, of course. Um, but if that were the case, if that were the case, then that would be something that is uh, fundamental and it couldn't be otherwise. Um, and the laws of physics or the ultimate law of physics could be that. Or if you have a traditional God, 
that could be that because God is defined uh, in, in many religious senses as where well. God's uh, ex- essence is the existence and, and the, the fund the simplicity of God has all characteristics the same or those who believe in cosmic consciousness that's the ultimate that reality is just this pure cosmic consciousness that leads to all the other things including our consciousness physical objects whatever so the three different kinds of ultimate realities that would be foundational to explain why there is something rather than the nothing we talked about now to uh, 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 understand what that means to be the ultimate reality what say what are those three things there could be something else but those are three big categories the deepest laws of physics some kind of god or gods or a universal cosmic consciousness are three candidates for what this ultimate reality could be from which everything else is derived whether consciously or unconsciously um, you have to ask another question is that fundamental reality that necessity a logical necessity which means it's impossible to be otherwise or is it a contingent necessity which sounds like it's an oxymoron that the, those words contradict each other but maybe in a way they don't in a sense that you know that is the way things are but it, it's not a contradiction of logic to think that it didn't have to be that way um, and so that is another kind of question now you want to think that you want the strongest kind of necessity which is a logical necessity in that to not have that would imply some logical contradiction but it's not clear to me under any of these conditions whether it's uh, ultimate laws of physics or a uh, a, uh, a fully empowered omni guard god or cosmic consciousness not clear to me how not having that would be a contradiction in logic and so even if you get to this ultimate necessity from which everything else springs or sprung um, whether what is the nature of that necessity would still be an open question now related there has been a lot of discussion over the last few years about simulation theory as presented by Nick Bostrom. But this right. is an old idea going back to Descartes and even religion. What are your thoughts on simulation theory? It's a nice probe of reality to, to, uh, to explore, to, under, to uh, enable us to understand many of the questions of physics and existence, which is great. So simulation, uh, to explore that, is a very legitimate exercise that has uh, many fascinating uh, elements to it, uh, to give you a few. Um, some would say we can actually discern that if we can show with the laws of physics at the 20th or 100th decimal place, there's some fuzziness. Um, that would apply whoever is creating what we're doing um, you know, at some level, they couldn't get absolute perfection in terms of some, uh, in terms of some ra- uh, fully uh, natural number. So you go out long enough, you, you'll see some fuzziness, and that could show there. Um, uh, it's possible. Uh, the argument, uh, the arguments uh, that support a simulation. Are, are interesting. Um, uh, Paul Davies has a very um, interesting approach to simulations in, um, in an argument that actually he, he, he says he used to undermine the multiverse theory, which was something to the effect that uh, if you have a multiverse with so many universes and so many possibilities, in, in some minuscule fraction of them, you would have beings that are able to do simulations. And once you could do a simulation, it will proliferate uh, at, 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 at uh, uh, rates that would swamp all the others. 
So if you believe in, in the multiverse, you almost at the same time have to commit yourself to a simulation since uh, once a being could do it, once it could do it virtually an infinite number of times. So those are the kinds of um, interesting uh, implications that one would, uh, one would look for. Of course, in a simulation theory, it, it almost... Uh, the way I would look at it is that it almost becomes irrelevant because what is the question? You're asking the curious question about whether we are a simulation, but you're not addressing at all the question of whether reality is a simulation because you, you, you to, to address the question we like to address about our universe, uh, you would just go one step up or a, if a, a, a Googleplex levels up to the ultimate level that first started doing it, and then you'd ask the same questions there that you'd ask here. So the the question is a, a fun one, uh, and and maybe and maybe relevant to our universe, but it it is only useful in terms of uh, of addressing ultimate reality. In showing that it does, it doesn't address ultimate reality. That that those questions of ultimate reality would remain. You just have to go up to the level of uh, of existence uh, to where that those questions needed to be asked. Now to switch gears, another theme in Closer to Truth is SETI and alien life, a subject that is very close to my heart because I would like to at least know if there are. It, there's microbial life <laughs> out there before I die. I don't know if we'll ever find intelligent life. I sort of suspect we won't. So I'm, I'd be content with microbes. But what's your sense? Do you think we are alone or do you take a more um, broader approach like some do that we're not special so there must be something out there? I, again, a great probe of, uh, of human sentience, our place in the universe, the nature of the universe. So it's, it's, a, it's a question way beyond uh, what it sounds, the interesting fact of knowing whether we're here or not, or whether we should be broadcasting and telling everybody that here we are, these, uh, you know, with our uh, warm bodies and, and, and water on our planet, so come, come, come. Uh, come exploit us or eat us or something, uh, those kinds of questions. It's very deep questions of, uh, of the nature of the reality in which we are. We obviously know uh, the Drake equations and Frank Drake's uh, original ideas about you multiply out the numbers and almost you put any uh, estimate into the equation, you're going to get very large numbers of, uh, of likely uh, civilizations out there. Uh, which, of course, all lead to the Fermi paradox. You know, where are they? Um, and you have, um, how many now do you have? Uh, you know, 50, 80 different explanations for the Fermi paradox, some of which sound interesting, all of which are interesting, and some of which might be probable. But I always ask, whenever, whenever you hear a, an explanation, uh, in order for that Fermi paradox explanation to hold, it will have to hold 100%. There can't be any exception, because any exception, given technology and time, any exception, it would multiply through von Neumann probes or whatever. You know, people have shown that, given very reasonable assumptions of technology, that a, any intelligent civilization could uh, could uh, inhabit the galaxy through through self-replicating probes within a very short period of, uh, of universal time. It's a, a million years, uh, 10 million years, 100 million years. I mean, uh, those are, that's the order of magnitudes that we're talking about for, for this to happen. So that is, um, the fact that it hasn't happened is, uh, is to me a disturbing evidence because you put all the, all the explanations together um, and you don't, you, you, you still have, uh, you, you must have each one be 100% effective. Whatever filters there are, self-destruction or, or beings more interested in virtual reality and then in, in, in actual reality, whatever the explanation, it has to be 100%, which skews me in a different direction. Um, I find it fascinating, though, that in exploring this question, which I 
love to do along with you uh, um, as a probe of how people think. And, and this is what I found, that um, I like to present the problem to both theists and atheists and see how the question of, of intelligent life in the universe, particularly intelligent life, would impact their theologies. I mean, Christians have, you know, thinking, uh, Christian philosophers have a hard time with this question because, you know, if you deal with their, their theology of the, um, of the death and resurrection and redemption through Christ, and versus, you know, one time only, uh, you know, was Christ's um, uh, experience on earth, does that affect everybody, all people for all, all, all life for all times throughout the universe? Or does each planet need its own savior? I mean, it's getting into very obscure questions, but they have to deal with it. They have to deal with it. So if you look at from theist and atheist point of view, which I've done, uh, you see this. Uh, I don't want. I, I say this factually, not not in the critical way. I really don't mean this critically. It may sound that way, but it is a complete rationalization on both sides. And so, from the atheist point of view, uh, let's start from the, the theist. The theist point of view: if there's no life, out, intelligent life outside Earth, they say, see, that proves that humans are special and God created us here. If there are forms of life in the universe that are intelligent, those theists, I assure you, will say this, start the same way. They will say, see, God created this universe for an abundance of sentient life. So it is a, a self-protective way of thinking that this, big, this biggest question of intelligence in the universe would be explained theistically, irrespective of whether there's nothing else besides human life or whether the universe is abundant in life. Now, let's flip it over to where the, how the atheists think. The atheists will say, if there is abundant life in the universe, see, humans are not special. God didn't make humans here. Evolution worked throughout the universe in the normal way. If there's no sentient life in the universe, the same atheists, I assure you, will say, see, there's no God, because the universe is inhospitable to life. There is no, the only life is here by a pure accident. The fact that the universe is so barren and so sterile proves there's no God. So the bottom line is whether there's you know, intelligent life in the universe or beyond Earth or not, atheists and theists will not change their views. Which is why I like the, um, when people ask me that question, whether I believe in anything or not, my answer is always, I have absolutely no clue. <laughs> <laughs> that is certainly the, the safest answer. Um, you know, and there are interesting people. I, I um, uh, was impressed when I spoke to Ray Kurzweil about this question some years ago. And he, he came to a more definitive answer than you and I would come to. And he, he thought there were not. And uh, he viewed, uh, his argument was, at least at that time, was based upon uh, his, uh, his great reliance on the exponential growth of technology, and that given the time available um, and the growth of technology, that, that we would see some evidence of that um, in, uh, in, 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 what's, uh, in, in what we see in the universe. Uh, others, many others would disagree with that, of course, and, and again, People uh, have ways now of looking at the atmosphere of exoplanets uh, through the through the, uh, uh, the, the uh, spectrographic analysis of the sunlight that will come through them as they transit uh, to look for chemical signatures of uh, of life. So, uh, you know, certainly an open open question. Um, I uh, would slightly skew to. Um, a a, um, a a lack of uh, of uh, evidence uh, is uh, not just the the uh, um, uh, that the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence, uh, which is the aphorism that's used. Uh, I I might slightly disagree with that, and uh, Ray Kurzweil's argument would be uh, part of the reason. Now about intelligence and the appearance of intelligence on Earth. Now, it has been argued that intelligence may not, 
be just unlikely, but it's a fluke. And a complex life, sure, you can have that. Uh, simple life, probably everywhere. But intelligent life is very unlikely. Now, I have an inherent issue with that argument in that Earth seems to be producing increasing intelligence in multiple different species. And, I mean, we are one of several species of hominid, and we happen to be the smartest, most recent one, but there were others that were making tools. And then you look at the dolphins and the animal intelligence. So to me, that seems like a, not a very good bet. But do you think intelligence is a fluke? In evolutionary theory, in one sense, everything is a fluke. And as uh, Stephen Gould said, if you ran the movie again, you would get, you would get different results. Um, uh, there are increasing thinking, though, that there are some trophisms in evolution, meaning that there are pulls in certain directions uh, in terms of um, self-replicating automata um, that, um, that have characteristics uh, to them if you go forward. Uh, the work that Stuart Kaufman does, for example, uh, reflects on some of these more um, sophisticated ways of, of, of looking at reality. Uh, from, from my experience, and, 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 uh, and, and, and uh, it's, it's uh, more thinking with your gut than with your brain, um, the idea of, of total randomness in evolution um, is, is 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 less attractive than it, it might be um, and in some sort of a, uh, a trophism towards complexity or intelligence you know seems to at least it's it's a it's a, a view that is worth uh, taking seriously not dismissing as some pre-scientific or pre-darwinian um, uh, hope based on um, you know a a ancient and archaic religious ideas. Uh, I, I don't think we've hit rock bottom in our understanding of the evolutionary process. Now back to the question of <laughs> religion, faith, society, and the discovery of intelligent alien life and what effect that might have. Now, I wonder if it's going to be very situational. For example, I think it would be a lot different if we saw some exoplanet that exhibited a techno signature, but it was hundreds of light years away, would be different to what we talked about earlier, a sentient von Neumann probe showing up in the solar system. So I think two effects would come from that. But do you think that we can handle it and that most people will just simply shrug and say, well, we figured aliens existed anyway? Or do you think it would fundamentally change all human global society? Well, I would think that anybody who thought about it uh, would recognize that our conceptual of reality has now narrowed. That um, views that are very wide in terms of the possibilities, which we've explored uh, uh, today, which I very much enjoyed our conversation exploring these things, the uh, boundaries of the possible <clears throat> will have been narrowed. And that is enormously exciting. Um, and, and, uh, and if uh, anybody gave thought to any uh, questions of human meaning, implication, role in the cosmos, uh, any role of religion, questions of even metaphysics, uh, you would have to take that seriously into consideration. Uh, that said, do you think that, um, you know, our Democratic and Republican uh, friends would, uh, would have any different conversation about uh, voting laws or uh, health care or stimulus? Uh, the answer to that is no. Uh, it's sad. I, I, wish they, I wish they would. I wish they would take seriously some other, other uh, impinging reality, uh, but uh, I doubt that would be the case. And my last question for you to connect back to the very first thing we talked about, consciousness in the universe. Does the universe need consciousness? It is certainly a part of the universe, but does it need it? There are multiple answers to that question. Uh, it's a critical question. Um, 
in a traditional evolutionary sense, materialistic evolutionary sense, based on, on scientific um, understanding, the answer is a clear and obvious and, and uh, an emphatic no. Uh, universe does, uh, nothing needs consciousness. It just happens to have been a, a phenomenon that, that, um, that happened in evolution, and people can give reasons that, uh, that uh, physical uh, beings were able to adapt better if they had uh, an inner awareness of stuff, although phys- uh, philosophical zombies who had, who had um, basically instinctive or spinal reactions to things doing the same thing could duplicate that. I mean, that's an argument that one could, could make, but uh, you don't need consciousness uh, at all. It's a late phenomenon that just happened to happen, and uh, it's, it's really irrelevant to, to anybody. Now, there is a, um, an asterisk you have to put to that, and that says there is an interpretation of quantum physics and uh, so-called Copenhagen interpretation that says that, that consciousness in some sense is necessary for the collapse of the waveform, so you go from the, class, the quantum world to the classical world. Uh, that is very much uh, in dispute in physics. Um, uh, I, I am less enamored with that explanation, although some explanation is clearly needed. So I do not see quantum physics as, uh, as a, uh, a counter to the argument that consciousness is a uh, is, is, from a physical point of view is a uh, is derived from just the natural evolutionary uh, processes. Um, now that of course leaves open the whole question of what is consciousness, because if consciousness, because the argument I just gave was under the assumption that consciousness was a purely physical material activity, um, and and therefore, it is not a necessity within the universe if everything is all physical. But if you think consciousness is anything beyond the physical, in any sense whatsoever, whether it's a dualistic, uh, non-physical world, or whether it's a, uh, a pantheistic, or a, you know, a, a, a quali, a multi-dimensional re- realities, any of those things would embed consciousness, uh, and certainly the Eastern traditions of a cosmic consciousness, any of those things, would make consciousness uh, an integral part of reality, or in, 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 in the latter case, in terms of Eastern, it, it, the primary reality and everything else derived from it. Um, so, so, so to answer the, the, the question, one must segregate the kinds of answers, or the kinds of assumptions that you make prior to coming up with your answer, and then and then seeing what the implications of each of those are. Uh, you know, Paul Davies, who, who's uh, another intellectual hero of mine, um, has uh, come up with the uh, radical idea that, that the consciousness, which he says he takes seriously, which means it's not just a, some kind of a, an irrelevant accident, uh, is uh, somehow in in, in a um, in a quantum history um, uh, environment, the consciousness that has emerged today is somehow able to select the histories, the qu- quantum histories prior that uh, it enabled it to happen itself. So it sounds like a backward causation and circular reasoning. Uh, but Paul was not uh, deterred by the uh, by the criticisms, and so he he likes explanations for the universe uh, within the this one universe is 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 has been his uh, his predilection, and uh, what his 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 argument is uh, is a wonderful way to see this you know very thoughtful smart individual struggling with the nature of consciousness and the nature of the universe to come up with what looks like a, a wildly bizarre theory that couldn't possibly be true. Uh, and yet, as Paul says, and I, I totally agree, that any theory you pick about the universe or even about consciousness, they all seem absurd. There's not a single possible uh, explanation, ultimate explanation, that does not sound absurd. 
Um, and so the, uh, <laughs> the answer is one of those absurd ideas is the, is the one that works. Um, and, uh, you know, you and I are probably not going to figure that out for a while. Now, we are almost out of time, but I wanted to ask you, where can, in addition to here on YouTube, where there's plenty of interviews and follow-ups and chats and everything on the Closer to Truth channel, where else can people find the content? Closer to Truth has two major vehicles. One is on television, on PBS stations around the country. Uh, sometimes we're not at the most uh, uh, happy uh, times of the day. It could be six in the morning or one in the afternoon. We don't generally get prime time uh, for our content on uh, Cosmos, cons Consciousness, and, and, and Meaning. Uh, but we are there. We are appreciative of stations broadcasting. So that that's, has been number one. Uh, online, of course, the last few years has been increasing dramatically. The Closer to Truth website, Closer to Truth, uh, as, as it's spelled, no spaces, and two is T-O, Closer to Truth dot com is our main website, in which we have uh, uh, well over 4,000 short interviews and um, now uh, uh, 200 and... Uh, uh, 57 or 247 right now be soon 257 of our primary show and we actually have 43 episodes from our original closer to truth shows in uh, 1999 and 2003 uh, also on closer to truth uh, .com. Uh, if you look at round tables the older shows as well um, and then of course most recently on YouTube in which there is a uh, subsection a sub selection of uh, shows that are being posted every day and and uh, interviews uh, and we're you know very appreciative uh, of uh, of our increasing viewers and I'm particularly happy to see the um, internationalization and, and the percentage of US viewers as a percentage of total going down I, I should tell you uh, and I appreciate the interview and discussion altogether that the one of the happiest experiences for me personally in close to the truth some viewers ask about that uh what 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 do, what do i what is my enjoyment obviously it's all my passion and i love doing it and love talking to these people and thinking about it but if, if you ask me what is my happiest experience it's this it's that when people write to us up from uh, in in closer to truth.com or on youtube and enjoy what we're doing that there is no way to predict the kind of person that is. And this means that there is no demographic, there is no economic level, even educational level, uh, uh, national origin, ethnicity, race, gender, um, anything that you can predict that will give, that will say this person is going to like closer to truth or like the kinds of questions that we deal with it and you deal with it too there's something i call it a small subset of humanity that cannot be identified by external characteristics that uh, surveyors or census takers or people who want to box us into categories of this race or that race or this political thinking or that or whatever that there is no way that any of those traditional ways of of, of de-aggregating humanity works in predicting interest in the kinds of questions we deal with in Closer to Truth. And to me, that's a great unifying factor. I mean, we get, I mean, we have, you know, as you do, probably 190 countries, and people write from every country, every religious background uh, that are fascinated by these kinds of, of questions. Uh, and that, to me, you know, gives me both great satisfaction and some hope for humanity. Oh, me too. And I, um, <laughs> when I started doing this, one thing I thought was, you know, what is the audience? But I found that one unifying thing among humans, one way or another, is curiosity. And I think that drives it all. I think that's terrific. All right, Robert, thanks for joining us today. And um, there will be links to everything in all of your materials in the description below. And I appreciate it. It was a wonderful conversation. Enjoyed it very much. Uh, keep up the good work and uh, we will, uh, we will uh, persevere together. 
Thanks for listening. I am Futurist and Science John, Fiction Author. Wrong channel. No, it's not. Thanks for listening. I am Futurist and Science Fiction Author John Michael Godier, currently hosting Event Horizon and wondering where Anna actually came from. One day I had a tablet computer, the next I had a boss. Very disturbing. Be sure. And that's enough of that. YouTuber forever. Like, subscribe, and hit the bell. Sell out. What?